Okay, let's briefly talk about a few of the classic episodes of the program. Uh, the first being uh, Devil in the Dark. Great episode. Um, and as an example of, of uh, how ill-treated the writers were, I don't remember who wrote it. But it was a wonderful episode. I think Gene Kuhn wrote it. I think Gene Kuhn wrote it. Um, it was a good classic Star Trek uh, with, a, with a wonderful, mor it was a wonderful morality tale. And uh, it worked extremely well. Um, what can I say? We were, we were um, called to a, a colony where some miners were having a problem. Some miners were extracting some kind of important mineral from mines below the earth and below the surface of the, of the planet. And they were being attacked by some kind of monstrous creature who was actually killing miners. And we discovered that uh, they had inadvertently broken into the nest of a creature that had laid its eggs in there, a, a mother creature, that a maternal creature had laid its eggs in there, and they were destroying these eggs. So in an effort to protect your eggs, this creature was rearing up and, and, and killing a, a miner or two or whatever. When we discovered that, we worked out a detente between the, the creature and the miners so that they could work in concert with each other. The, the creature would actually help the miners find the veins of, of the mineral they were mining, and they, in turn, would respect her nest and her and her children. Uh, Devil in the Dark was the name given to the that, the unknown. The the miners didn't know what this was. They were terrified of it, and therefore they they demonized it and attacked it. Uh, that's what that was about. Now, your character used a mind meld in that. Can you uh, talk about the origin of the mind meld? Spock had a mind meld with this creature, with this horta creature, and. Uh, in an effort to, because it didn't, it had no language, had no speech. So he was trying to discern what this creature was about, what it had to say, what it, what it wanted to communicate to us. And, and it was through his mind melt with the creature that he discovered what was, what, about the story that I just told, that, that it was a mother creature trying to protect its eggs. And another, uh, another Vulcanism was uh, the neck pinch. Yeah. How did that come about? That was my way of avoiding fist fights. I, I had gotten very tired of, of all the years of playing heavies and being involved in fist fights with, uh, or gunfights or whatever kind of fights with adversaries in television shows and movies. And, and I thought, here's a chance to cleverly avoid all of that. <clears throat> I didn't want to be involved in fist fights in Star Trek. We were doing an episode where, where Kirk was, uh, was split into two characters. It was a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde story. Malfunction in the transport splits him into two personalities, his evil side and his good side. Oh, it's Mirror Mirror? Sorry? Is it Mirror Mirror? Uh, yes, I think so. Uh, m perhaps not. I, 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 no, I, I don't know. Mirror Mirror, I think, was an episode in which Spock had, took on a different personality as well. But in this particular episode, um, I'm, I don't think I can recapture the title of the, the show. Uh, in any case, uh, there was a confrontation between the evil and the good Kirk in one scene, and the evil Kirk has, a, has the weapon, and is saying to the, to the good Kirk, I don't need you, I don't need you. And uh, he's in, we're in danger that the good Kirk is going to be killed, and, and Kirk would never be the same after that. So, The writer had written that Spock sneaks up behind the bad guy and hits him over the head with the butt of his phaser to knock him out, and I said, I think we can do better than that. So I suggested to the director that I have this special capability of putting a, some energy into the human anatomy that would render a guy unconscious. And he said, well, let's see what it looked like. And I explained to Bill what I was going to do, and I came up behind Bill, and I put my hand on his neck like that. And Bill sold it. He froze up like that and dropped to the floor. And the Vulcan neck pinch was born. And I was out, I was out of fighting. <laughs> All I had to do was reach out, knock people out with a, with a neck pinch. What about the Vulcan salute? That came from my Jewish background. It's a, it's it's a, it's a gesture that the uh, that's used in a priestly benediction during the uh, uh, Jewish services in synagogues. The uh, the Kohanim, who are the priest tribe, bless the congregation. When they do, they use this gesture, which is this is the shape of the letter Shin, Hebrew alphabet. Letter Shin, and the letter Shin is the first letter in the word Shaddai, which is the Almighty's name in Hebrew, 
and the suggestion is that they're using the symbol of the Almighty's name as they bless the congregation. I saw it done as a kid, was entranced by it, learned how to do it, and I brought it into Star Trek. Was it known that's what it was? No, I didn't make an issue of that. Uh, we were doing a lovely episode written by Theodore Sturgeon, a wonderful script called uh, A Mock Time, in which uh, Spock has to be taken back to Vulcan. He insists on going back to Vulcan because he's going through this pond far condition, which is a mating condition, and he has to go back and, and fulfill a marriage betrothal that's been arranged since he was a child. We get back to the Vulcan planet, and, he, and we're confronted by the, this procession that comes out to meet us, and very important matriarchal character being carried in a sedan chair and and I'm to greet her and she's to welcome me back to Vulcan. I haven't been there in quite a while and we're supposed to say hello to each other and I suggested to the director that there should be some Vulcan thing that Vulcans do when they greet like humans shake hands or military people salute each other, Asian people bow to each other. We have rituals. What's the Vulcan ritual on, on a greeting? And I said, well, how about that? I said, okay. So I did that, and she did that, and and next thing I knew it was in the scripts, Spock with the Vulcan salute. You know? <laughs> it caught on. Um, do you have a favorite episode? Favorite? Well, you've just mentioned a couple of them. Devil in the Dark was wonderful. A Mock Time was a, a, a Theodore Sturgeon wrote us a very beautiful poetic script. He wrote Live Long and Prosper in that script. First time those words were spoken. Um, there was another uh, wonderful time story written by Harlan Ellison, uh, City on the Edge of Forever, wonderful love story between Kirk and, the, uh, and a lady in the 1930s, a time warp story, wonderful script. Um, Roddenberry, Gene uh, took the original pilot and wrote around it a wonderful envelope that, so we could use the original pilot material as a two-parter episode in the new series. Uh, I think it was finally called The Menagerie. And uh, that was wonderful, the two episodes that we did, using uh, material from the original pilot where, where Jeffrey Hunter was the captain of the ship. Do you have a least favorite? Spock's brain. Pretty bad. Somebody's notion of what it would be like if some alien race decided they wanted Spock's brain and took it out of his head to help him run their planet or something or other. I don't know. Not good. What did you think when you were filming it? Not good. <laughs> I knew it was not good. I, I wanted to mention, too, that, that you received, for every season, you received an Emmy nomination for Best Supporting Actor. Yeah. How did you feel about that? I felt yeah. elated that I was nominated. Um, but I think... I think to be frank about it, the fact is you can't win uh, creative honors in, in science fiction. Science fiction, uh, actors in science fiction don't win best actor or best supporting actor. Uh, you don't even, you, even the writers, uh, good science fiction, it's considered a subgenre somehow. Oh, those guys making those science fiction shows. You can, get them, you can win an award for special effects. Uh, in, in science fiction, television, or movies. But you can't win awards for acting or writing, typically. I can't think of any writers or directors or actors who won Academy Awards for directing science fiction. It doesn't work that way. The, the academies typically tend to honor social drama of a contemporary kind, something that has powerful social significance today. Uh, whatever it is, it's, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's a judgment that's passed. Um, but I, I, was, I was very flattered to be uh, nominated. The nomination came from, from the membership, the acting department membership, and I was very flattered by that. What do you think is the legacy of Star Trek? Well, it's, I think it's different for different people. Uh, I think it, it gave a, a tremendous uh, number of people, something very interesting to think about uh, through drama, through science fiction, um, a, a vision of ourselves, a vision of the world from this particular point of view, from the vantage point of, of another society 300 years later, uh, dealing with problems and issues that we can relate to. I think, I think that's, that's the important legacy. I think in terms of creativity, in terms of production, in terms of industry, 
for me, the legacy has always been that uh, the good story is what's needed. Always a good story. Is it a good story? Is it a good story? It doesn't matter how many ships you blow up or how many how many missiles you fire or how many explosions you show or, or how many uh, disasters are depicted or uh, fights or action or whatever. Uh, it doesn't matter. Is it a good story? Something you can take home with you and think about and uh, affects you, makes you feel that you're part of the human race. That, for me, that's an important legacy. Let's move on to uh, Mission Impossible from 1969. How did that come about for you? Star Trek was canceled at the end of the third season, and um, these were sister shows, as I mentioned earlier. They were both being produced by, by now by Gulf and Western. Uh, Marty Landau and his wife, his then wife Barbara Bain, were on Mission Impossible and were having trouble in renegotiating for their fourth season. And uh, they came to an impasse, that uh, was my understanding, and the studio decided that they could not go ahead with them, would not, would not uh, negotiate with them any further. And uh, the next thing I knew, I got a phone call from my agent who said that you were wanted for Mission Impossible. I'd been, I'd been uh, out of work maybe a month off of Star Trek, and I was okay. I, I had, uh, I, I felt that I had a future. I, I, I had some recognition now, and I could, I could, I could find work. But here came a, comparatively a very lucrative job. I, I was offered much more money to come on Mission Impossible than I'd been paid on Star Trek. And, and I was also very intrigued with the idea that the character that I would be portraying was, was a, a person who portrayed other characters, so I could have a lot of diversity. I could play a lot of different kinds of roles. And as a character actor, that was very appealing to me. So I went to work for two seasons, and then the fun ran out. It, I wasn't interested beyond that. Uh, I found the same characters coming around again. I was again asked to play the Latin American dictator. I was again asked to play the very old man disguised as a spy, disguised as a very old man. I was again asked to play the European uh, uh, bureaucrat or dictator. I was again asked to play a blind man. I was again asked to play a Japanese character. I've done that. I did it, guys. I did it last season. Uh, 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 and there was no... There was no character development now. There was no internal life to these. These were all charades. They were all empty characters. So there was no spiritual um, um, replenishment. I was just being asked to throw on the makeup and do a dialect and do this or that and be gone again. I asked them to let me out, and they did. What was the premise of the show? The premise was uh, that the, there were these very special, very extremely difficult missions which were handed over to this crack team of specialists led by Mr. Phelps, who would assign the mission to his various uh, uh, team members. Barney, you do this. Paris, you do this. So-and-so, you do that. We're after this person. Here's a picture. And uh, the, the aim is to do some secretive work that uh, solves this problem. This person is a problem. We've got to solve this problem somehow. We've got to trick him or her in such a way that he or she leaves office or turns over such papers or whatever it is that has to get done. What was your character's name? My character's name was Paris. Was there any backstory to Paris? I wish there had been. <laughs> no, backstory would have been helpful. Paris was uh, a man about town, uh, a bon vivant kind of guy. There was one moment, one moment in one episode where we saw Paris functioning as Paris, brief as it was. Usually the show would start with the, the meeting of the mission crew, and Mr. Phelps would handle it. And you'd sit there and say, uh-huh, and you'd ask a question to you, say, how much time do we have, or when do we start, or what country is it, or why are we having this problem? And then he'd answer that, and, and seem to be over, and now from there on in, you'd be acting in the charade. Well, there was one episode where, where uh, as I recall, Paris was not in on the original assignment. We see somewhere in the course of the show we see Paris's apartment, which we've never seen before. It's night. The door opens, and Paris comes in dressed in a tux, like he's just coming off of a date or an event someplace. And as he walks in, the phone is ringing. He picks it up and answers the phone. It's Mr. Phelps asking him to come to work on an assignment. That was the most personal moment we ever saw of Paris in the entire two years I've ever played the show. There was no internal life for Paris and no backstory. It was all about what Paris could do rather than what Paris was. Uh, can you talk about working with Peter Graves on that show? Did I, what about Peter? Uh, just talk about working with him a little bit. Peter's okay. a terrific guy, uh, easy to relate to, easy to talk to, very professional, uh, a perfect Mr. Phelps, man in charge, authority figure, Jim Arness's brother. 
Uh, Greg Morris? Same. Fun guy, fun-loving guy, great sense of humor, big laugh, uh, who was always stuck in elevator shafts and, and, and uh, tunnels, digging his way through problems. <laughs> what about Peter Lupus? Peter Lupus, big, wonderful bear of a guy, uh, like a marshmallow, like a giant marshmallow. Easy to talk to, wanted to have a good time. He was a, a health addict who would pop 30 or 40, a handful, a handful of pills, vitamin pills of various kinds every morning, gulping them down, gulping them down. And, wow. <laughs> What's Sam Elliott? Sam Elliott I didn't get to know very well. Um, uh, my memory of him was that he was, he was very curious. He, was, he didn't have, I don't think he had a lot of experience when he came on the show. And I remember him lurking off camera, watching us constantly to see how we did what we did. And I think he had much more to do on the series when I left. I left after the second season. I, I assumed that he stayed on longer. I really didn't pay much attention. I think he stayed on longer and had more to do later. One more name, Leslie Ann Warren. Leslie was, was terrific. I've always admired her. Um, she and I came on the show at the same time in the fourth season. And uh, she left, I think, at the end of one season. I looked at the end of two. She had the same kind of approach to acting that I did, so I felt kind of a kindred spirit with her. And we spent a lot of time talking ideas about acting and what we might bring to the show and whatever. We both had the same frustration on the show. She wanted an, an internal life, too. Uh, later, when I, I got to direct for the first time in television, I hired her to star in an episode of Night Gallery that I directed. I, I've always thought highly of her. I think she's a very talented lady. Do you have any favorite episodes? Sure. On mission, mm -hmm. probably the first or one of the very first that I did, where I, I got to play a Che Guevara character, <clears throat> beard, uh, beret, cigar, uh, Cuban or South American guy, and I enjoyed it. And I thought, oh, I'm 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 going to get into something on this series. And it was kind of downhill from there. <laughs> I don't mean to denigrate the series. The series was obviously enormously successful. It went on for eight years, and it went on for. Uh, several years after I left, so obviously I, I didn't do it any injury. Um, it survived very nicely without me. And because it was a very interesting idea, it was a fun idea. It was a very visual show as compared to Star Trek, which was a very verbal show. Star Trek depended very heavily on the actors and what the actors could do or say with each other. Mission depended very heavily on the camera and where the camera was pointed and what you saw, a piece of this and a piece of that. And it became a crossword puzzle that came together in an interesting, or a jigsaw puzzle that came together in an interesting kind of way. And we used to say you could walk out of the room and, on Star Trek and listen and keep in touch with the plot. You couldn't do that with Mission. If you walked out of the room and missed a scene, you'd get lost. You didn't know what was going on when you came back into the room. But with Star Trek, you could, if you could just hear it, you could stay with the story. What about the way that the, both sets were run, uh, Star Trek and Mission Impossible, in terms of Desilu? Was there a difference in... Well, as I mentioned before, Desilu uh, uh, had sold Mission at a much better price. So they had a much better budget to work with and much more time. And they had five characters, as I recall, where a lot of the work was split. So if you were on Mission, you had a lot more relaxed time. With Star Trek, Bill Shatner and I, once the show got going, we were in almost every scene. Uh, once in a while there would be scenes of he alone with somebody else or me alone with somebody else, but much of the time we were in everything. Whereas on mission I had a lot of downtime because the, the time because the time was carved up amongst all these different characters. And they were shooting all this stuff with Barney in the elevators and in the subway and, uh, tubes and so forth. You could sit in your dressing room and read and watch television, maybe take a nap to take care of other business, which at times time was boring, but it was also restful by comparison. In 1971, uh, you co-starred in your first television movie, Assault on the Way. Yeah. How did that go for you? Not a very good experience. Uh, the script wasn't exactly right, and I don't, I, I don't think I was very good in it. I don't think I did a great job. I was playing the, the captain of a submarine uh, under duress, uh, under a strange circumstances, and a guy with a problem. And, and that, I didn't handle that. I, I wasn't comfortable doing that. Uh, something about it just didn't come together very well for me. The show was okay, we got it done, it, and, and I was the star of a television movie for the first time, but I wish I'd had something, I wish I'd been able to do something better. And then in 1972, you began directing. The, 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 it was called Assault on the Wayne, and, and the joke was, who would assault John Wayne? You know? <laughs> 
The Wayne was the name of the of the of the submarine. In 1972, you began uh, directing. 72, yeah, 72. I signed a contract at Universal Studios for a year. The intention was to work there doing guest starring roles, and my hope was to start doing some directing. And in fact, they had hopes of developing a television series for me to star in. And uh, the most exciting thing for me was that I did start directing there that year. I did guest starring roles on Columbo and two or three other shows. I did a television movie with Henry Fonda, which was a big kick because I was a fan of his. Um, I did two or three other things. I did a couple of night galleries, acted in a couple of night galleries. Uh, I turned down a lot of stuff, which made the studio very unhappy with me because they, they were wondering how, the, how to get the money's worth out of me. They were paying me a, a weekly salary. And I, I went to Sid Scheinberg, who was the head of the studio, and I said, I came in here as a well-liked, popular character actor. I could go out of here as heavy of the year. I'm, you're asking me to do a heavy in every series. They had a beta 10 series on the air, and they were offering me these these heavies in each of these shows. A couple of them were interesting. Columbo was always fun to do, and good people came on to play the heavies. But a lot of the others were just just bad bad people, you know. And I had done so much of that in my earlier years, I wanted to put that behind me. And Gene Roddenberry was hired to come in and develop a television series that I was supposed to star in. And I'm going to cut right to the chase here. When the time came to cast it, at the end, they cast somebody else. I was relieved, frankly. I didn't want to be there. I didn't want to do another series. Uh, he did a pilot for something called the Questra Tapes, I think. And they and uh, I was shocked. They were developing the makeups for me, the wardrobe for me. I saw the sketches in the wardrobe department and the makeup department based on my shape, size, face, and so forth. Days before we were supposed to start shooting, I discovered they had hired Robert Foxworth to play the part. To this day, I swear to you, I don't know exactly what happened. Gene said that, <laughs> that they, he was the producer, and they called him, and the writer, and they called him one day and said, we'd well, like to show you some film. And he said, he went to his screening room, and they were showing, looking at film of different actors for this role or that role. And he said to me, they showed me some footage of this actor, Robert Foxworth, and they said, what do you think of him? And I said, I liked him. The next thing I knew, they had hired him to play the lead in the show. I thought, well, Gene, really? You know? <laughs> But that's the story he told me, and I let it, I was relieved. I said, thanks, I'm out of here. I wanted to go off and do other things. Well, in 1972, you directed uh, a night gallery. Night gallery, yeah. Was that your first directing? First film? time directing for television, yes. Yes. <clears throat> um, the producer, again, was a guy who had a track record of starting directors. And... Uh, <clears throat> I was given a very lovely script called Death on a Barge, which was really a Romeo and Juliet story told in vampire terms. The girl is a vampire, we discover, and dangerous. And her father knows that she's a vampire and keeps her on this barge because the, the barge is surrounded by flowing water in a drainage canal. And a vampire cannot cross flowing water. So he feels he's got her safely locked up on this barge. Young guy comes down to the dock and sees her and they start conversation. He's on the dock, she's on the bar. They fall in love with each other through conversation. And eventually one day, the young guy comes to talk to her and discovers that the, that the barge has been uh, canal has been drained. The water's gone. And she's out somewhere, and she gets off and kills somebody. But he's still very much attracted to her and ends up going, going on board the barge to, to have a private moment, have an experience with her, which turns to disaster, or he almost almost bites the dust, and the father comes in and drives a stake into her heart. That's the end of our vampire Juliet, you know. I had a lot of fun doing it. I had a great time. Have you worked with Jack Laird as a producer? Jack Laird was the producer. Uh, the script was, was poetry. It was a very good script. And he gave it to me to read. So tell me, I had approached him several times that I want to direct, I want to direct. And finally, he called me one day, and he said, come on over. And he handed me a script, and he said, um, go read this and tell me what you think of it. I came back, I said, it's great, I love it. He said, well, you should. It's a good script. And he gave it to me to direct. The cameraman on the series was very helpful. It was a man named Jerry Finnerman, who had been our cameraman on Star Trek. So I knew him, and I went to him. I said, Jerry, I'm going to get to direct an episode. He said, great. So I knew I was in good hands with him. He was going to be helpful. Did you get to meet Rod Serling at all? At no. Had you ever met him in your career? No, never. 
Oh, that's in 1976. Uh, you hosted in search of. Yeah. And how did that? Uh, uh, sheer luck. Uh, I had I had been hired by another company to do a pilot for a similar series called The Unexplained, and uh, <clears throat> they had me uh, under exclusive contract for a period of time during which they had the opportunity to sell that series off the pilot that we had done. It was a, it was very different in style. It was a it was a, a sit down with guests kind of talk show with some footage that would be thrown in, but I was essentially interviewing people who had had supposedly interesting experiences. I uh, interviewed a young guy who claimed to have been abducted on a spaceship, you know, by aliens, and had one of those experiences. So I did the pilot, and then during the selling period, my agent called me and said, we're getting calls from this other company that has a series called In Search Of, and they want you, but I've told them that they can't have you, in, uh, for a while at least, uh, uh, because you're tied up with this unexplained contract. However, he said, they know what the due date is that, this con you're, that their selling period expires and they lose you, their option on you after a certain date. And sure enough, the day after they didn't sell the show and the day after the option ran out, bang, they called and hired me to do In Search Of. So it turned out to be a very lucky break for me. I had a lot of fun doing the show. The subject matter was fun, sometimes very interesting and sometimes just fun. And we did seven years. I thought two or three seasons, max. You know, how many times can you do Bigfoot, hypnosis, uh, uh, alien abductions, uh, extrasensory perception, uh, faith healing? You know, you can name the titles in a, on, uh, with, with two hands. Uh, we did 144 episodes and <laughs> had a wonderful time. Now, what was your involvement? Did you actually go on, on location? Uh, I went to very few locations. The show was engineered in such a way that they made very good use of my time. I could shoot the location stuff for five shows in one day. During the period of time that we were making that show, I was doing a lot of stage work around the country. One period of time, I was six months on Broadway in a production of Equus that I was starring in. And during that period of time, about once a month or every five or six weeks, they would come to New York on my day off. We'd start out with a camera crew at about 8 o'clock in the morning, and we'd go to maybe there'd be a, a gray mansion someplace in the city in Manhattan, and there we'd shoot up against the wall and staircase some story about an English ghost story, a haunted English castle. Then maybe in the backyard there would be some gravestones. We'd go right out there and shoot a cemetery story about ghosts. And go right from there over, right over the Hudson River, river and talk about, uh, do, a, do an episode about global warming. Then we go right from there to an Indian museum uh, where we, we do a show about Indian faith healing, you know. And I'd be done by 5 or 6 o'clock with, with the on-camera stuff for, for maybe five shows. The next day or two, I would go into the studio and do the narrations, and I was very fast at it. We could do narrations for five or six shows in a couple of hours. Were you personally interested in, in... Some of the subject matter I was very interested in. Some of it, what I call the sticks and bones shows, didn't interest me. I'm not an archaeologist. I'm not interested in the stuff that comes that, that comes out of these digs. Doesn't mean a lot to me. Some people get very excited about it. Doesn't mean a lot to me. But I was very interested in extrasensory perception. I was very interested in hypnosis. I was very interested in in uh, supernatural phenomena, uh, metaphysical stuff. Always, I was curious about it. Um, and occasionally we did biography kind of stories that fascinated me. And I, I directed occasionally and had a good time. We'll stop here to change the tape. Perfect.